Hello, hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Let's Process That podcast. I'm one of your co-hosts, Emily Christopher. My other host here is Nick Connorkamp, and we are so excited today to be joined by Hillary Bolter. We're going to have a fascinating conversation, definitely one that you all have requested that we bring someone in for this very topic. And like I said, um, we really are gauging a lot of feedback from you guys. You all are responding. You are putting input in. This is not just a two-way or three-way conversation between Nick and I or our guest, but we really appreciate all the feedback we are getting um, and things that you all want to hear about. And so that's what we're doing. We are saying yes, and we're going out and we are finding some fascinating people. So Nick... You helped us um, become our with our new friend here, Hillary. Um, and so I'm going to toss it to you, Nick, so that you can um, kick off this interview. And we're excited about where today's conversation is going. Perfect. Well, I'm not going to quiz you, Emily, on uh, on one of the things that I'm passionate about because I don't want you to mess up on screen. But remember when we would go to a conference together and I would say the most important thing about going to a conference is not the material you're going to receive, but meeting someone that can carry on and have a relationship beyond that. And uh, about a year ago, I was at a conference for the Veteran Services of the Carolinas and Hillary Bolter was one of the presenters there. Got a chance to just sort of meet her in the peripheral and enjoyed her presentation. And then when we started talking about mental health issues, I reached out to our friend Brandon Wilson and said, Brandon, give me a name. And he said, Hillary, all day long, call Hillary. And I'm like, okay, we'll do that. So Hillary Bolter has her own practice where she is a mental health therapist. She not only treats people individually, but also does trainings for organizations. And that's where I got to know her a little bit. Uh, She's an LCSW. The reason I bring that up, that she's an LCSW, is because when I got out of the church lane and got into the humanitarian lane, There were terms like RA, peer support specialist, LCSW, and stuff like that I became aware of. And she she helps people. That's a licensed clinical social worker. She helps people um, work through mental health issues, addictions, and that's what intrigued us. And so, Hillary, welcome to our show, and we're excited to have you today and uh, appreciate you taking the time to do that. Um, when I say LCSW, obviously that doesn't fully describe who you are, but what do you think that means to most folks to hear that you're a licensed social worker? Well, it means I have an advanced degree in clinical social work and that I have also become licensed in addition to that, which means several years of clinical supervision and hours where I have learned under someone more senior um, really a lot of the clinical pieces that I need to know to effectively help people. Um, and um, to remain licensed, there's requirement to gain continuing education every year and maintain that license. So there are ethical pieces that's saying, hey, I am committed to being a lifelong clinician learner, that I am not an expert at any one moment, and that sure. I am I'm, I'm ready to I'm I'm committed to continue learning to help the people that I work with the best that I can. So being, having an advanced degree and having this level of licensure, what drew you to this? This is not something that happened by accident. This is something that you intentionally leaned in and invested a lot of your time and energy. Tell me a little bit about that. What drew you into this field? Well, I think I'm going to have to start with my parents there. You know, it's, it, it comes so from family all. values. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I had a great mentor at the VA who always said, you know, Let's honor the shoulders on which we stand. You know, we all are standing on the shoulders of others in our past and in our professions. And um, it's interesting that you asked that question because my father recently passed. And so I've been reflecting a lot about um, the values that he instilled in me and, and who I am as a result of him and my mother. And they met at divinity school in the seventies. They met at um, divinity school and, um, my mom went into uh, becoming ordained in the Methodist church. And my father, um, after that, went into special education. And so I grew up in a family um, system in, Atlanta, in the city of Atlanta, Atlanta, Georgia, where I constantly saw my parents committed to supporting their community 
to supporting others, to um, learning and being in relationship, to being um, connected to church communities, to service. Um, uh, my, my mother was a part of a group that started a homeless shelter in the basement of Trinity United Methodist in Atlanta, which is still going today. Wow. That's cool. So um, it, it was sort of like just this continuation of how I grew up. Um, I always knew that I wanted to help support people in their growth and change. And my mom also had a private practice and she, I remember at one point she said, just don't become a therapist. It's hard. It's hard. <laughs> I think she was trying to be protective of me. And, and here I became a therapist and my sister became an educator. So we really followed in their footsteps. Oh, that's, that's awesome. wonderful. Well, thank you for what you do, especially post 2020. Um, we're all, it, it's interesting because it, it, when we look at 2020, we see that those who are struggling struggled pretty significantly. And then the rest of us all realized that we're all struggling at some level. And, and it was this great awareness. Tell me a little bit about what your work looked like pre-2020 and then post-2020. And tell us, you know, how things have shifted and changed. I would say that I have seen just an amplification and exacerbation of what was happening before. And I see it even in my own family and with my children. You know, what was hard before became really amplified and harder during the pandemic with the isolation and the fear um, that was there. Um, things feel really intense and that intensity impacts people. And I know your listeners, um, a lot of your listeners are supporting congregants um, and members of the community and uh, things are amplified. Okay. So tell me a little bit about um, self-care, um, the sort of things that you're running into and how you're able to help some folks process and deal with what they're, what they're dealing with now. Well, I love, I love the term self-nurturing even more than self-care um, because I think self-care um, has some associations with like bubble baths and massages and, and also like white privilege. <laughs> um, I think, you know, members of different socioeconomic classes and BIPOC community, right. et cetera, may not, uh, that, that may not feel connected to that term. Um, sure. And so, yeah, I think that, um, and I say it too, still sometimes I'm like, I need some more self-care. <laughs> um, but I like the self-nurturing, like in what ways are we nurturing ourselves, our spirit, our physical body, um, our mind, um, our soul. And so that question, the answer to that question is going to be different for every single person that we talk to. It might be both last and massages for someone, um, but it might be other things. I'm curious when you talk with people about self-care or self-nurturing, what comes up? Yeah, I would Lord. say, I know, I know for me, um, I think especially after the pandemic or during the pandemic, we were all very much encouraged, get outside. You know, we're all in our homes. And one thing I feel like that was sparked from that, or at least what I see in my community, um, without having any economic implications or anything like that, people could get outside there you know, where you live, even if it's just the park across the street, or if you are more adventurous and you wanted to take up hiking and that kind of thing. And I think a lot of people that I've seen have really been able to reconnect with nature in some kind of small way. Um, and, and others I've seen it stick. And I have a few friends who all of a sudden now they're really into hiking where before the pandemic, they were not. Um, but that is one beautiful thing that I've, I've seen. Um, and have, I don't know if that's something that goes back to you and your practice and what you've been um, talking about with your clients and patients and that kind of thing. Um, has that been a reoccurring theme for you as well, Hillary? Absolutely. I mean, I'm a big, uh, my, my undergraduate is actually in therapeutic uses of the wilderness. So oh, I, cool. I really, I believe there's a lot of healing um, ability in the wilderness and yeah. our, our biology is wired and connected to that as a resource. and um, Although some of us may be less comfortable than others with being out in it. Um, but I, that's a, a tremendous and um, a, available resource to us. You know, the, mm -hmm. the sun, um, the birds. I cracked a window in this room just so I could hear the birds this morning. Yeah. Cool. 
Yeah, that's interesting because in 2020, I went, I went dipped very low. It was not, it was very difficult for me. And I had to measure my energy every single day. I'd wake up and I said, I'm a two. I'm a two and I cannot afford to go to one. I have got to do. And I literally would go and sit, get somewhere uh, where we live. Lake Junaluska is a wonderful place to get outside just to see, feel the sunshine, the, the actual vitamin D, the sunshine helped me raise my level of energy just a little bit. In fact, a week ago Sunday, um, I went to hiking church. There's a church in Asheville that does hiking church on Sunday morning. And I went and it was wonderful to be outside and just go up to the top of a mountain and enjoy that a little bit. Um, one of the things that when you say self-nourishment, I'm a dude. We weren't taught self-nourishment. Nobody ever <laughs> grabbed me as a boy and said, listen, one thing you need to learn is self nourishment so how difficult is it uh post 2020 for a a guy to come in and say i need some help and for you to talk to them about self-nourishment because it's never even been on my radar talk a little bit about that for people like me right uh, from that more masculine perspective i think some of it is finding the language that fits right so whether it's self-nurturing -nur nourishment self-care um, or, or other metaphors like oxygen mask over self first. That's something yep. we know if we've ever been on a plane. And if you're a dad and you have your daughter sitting next to you on a plane, it's real clear to you <laughs> that you need to keep yourself alive so you can really be there for her. Right? right. And so that may be a metaphor that connects for someone. Or if, if a client is really into sports. Um, I'm enjoying Ted Lasso right now, watching yes. soccer. And I think about <laughs> last night I was like in tears. I was like, oh my gosh, it's so good. Um, but um, sports, you know, if you're not taking care of physical body, then you can't perform on the field. Um, and so what does that, that mean for you? So I think it's, it's really less about, I have a prescription for you for self-care, um, but if what what is important to you? What are your values? Is it to to be a strong dad? Is it to be a, a strong pastor to show up in your community? Then how do you be your best self? And what does it take to get there? And there is going to be some self nourishing, you know, in that. Um, I'll share an acronym. I might let you respond first, and then I have an acronym to share. No, go ahead and share your acronym, and then I've got a question for you. Sure. Um, this is an acronym I learned, um, and I can't, I don't know who to quote for this or cite for this, but it's MEDS, M-E-D-S. Um, and it's, it was from a psychiatrist who said, you can take your meds, you can do your meds, or you might need both. And it stands for mindfulness, exercise, diet, and sleep. Oh, good. And that those are just concrete, basic things that we all need to stay in our whole brain. <laughs> um, what kind of mindfulness practice supports your serenity? Is it church? Is it hikes? Is it um, prayer? Is it meditation? Is it music? Meditation. Is it art? Is it right? So what supports your mindfulness? You know, the exercise, we need to move our physical bodies. We need to keep things moving. What does exercise and movement look like for you? And then the diet piece is the nourishment. It's not go on a diet to lose weight. It's just the food that we need to nourish our bodies to perform the best that they can. Uh, water, food, and then sleep. Sleep is so essential to our basic brain function. Our brains cleanse themselves. They go through a wash cycle when we sleep. And if we don't get that, we can't be our best self. That's really good. By the way, I still uh, practice your four by four meditation. You breathe in for four seconds, hold for four. So just, just wanted you to know you've impacted someone in the room last year. Um, I This is something that Emily and I talk a lot about is shame. And I would think that if someone had a physical ailment and went to the hospital, very rarely do are they driven by shame. But if they have a mental issue that drives them to counseling, I would expect that a, a, a more than 50% probably deal with some level of I'm broken, I'm bad. Can, can you unpack that a little bit with us? That is such a message that we've received for so long. And it's really beautiful to me. I was just remarking to my daughter the other day, we were watching some TV together that had advertisements and they were advertising a telehealth service that had medication, a telehealth service that was counseling, 
they were having movie stars normalize and talk about those things. And I was like, this is really remarkable. Like I can mark as somebody who's not 10 years old that the world didn't look and feel this way that long ago. Um, so it, we're making progress and we still have a long way to go because there's not, not enough adequate high quality mental health support out there for everyone. Um, and we can see how that's impacting our, um, our country and our communities every day. Um, in terms of unpacking it, I'd be, let, tell me what y'all's thoughts are on that. Well, I guess, and Emily, jump in whenever you want to, but I, I guess for me, um, when you're a physician dealing with a physical thing, you don't even have to consider the shame piece. But when you're dealing with, when you're counseling someone who's dealing with a mental health issue or dealing with an anxiety or something, it would feel to me that you would have to somehow address shame directly where, where most, uh, most clinicians wouldn't have to do that. And I'm just curious if that is a specific tool that you bring out to address, or if it's a byproduct that you sort of just leave alone and you address the main product and after a while that'll go away. But it feels to me that shame would be uh, the elephant in the room for most people. Mm -hmm. uh, the word normalize comes to mind. I think it's really powerful as helping professionals for us to normalize the experiences mm -hmm. of the people with us. And that can be as simple as saying, um, it must be have, have been really hard to come in here today, and what you're going through is really normal. We there are a lot of people that are suffering or struggling in the way that you are, and you don't see it on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's really yeah. Cool. That it just immediately reminds me. I have a I have a friend who is just really good at always making you feel normal, <laughs> um, and she does such a beautiful job of holding space. And anything that I bring up to her, I come to her as a friend, she immediately empathizes. And she's like, I am so sorry you feel that way. I I hate that you're going through this. And that immediately breaks down that shame for me, that there's somebody who can look me in the eye and be like, I see how you're struggling. I see that you're hurt, you're wounded, um, that there's been something that has really taken something from you. And I want you to know, like, I see you and I love you and I'm here for you. I may not be able to give you the answers, but I'm going to be here and sit with you in this. And that has been one of the most powerful things. And of course, that's speaking from a friendship perspective, but I think even just on a human perspective, um, that it's just important for us to be able to do that for one another, um, not necessarily even in a clinical space. But um, if anyone comes to us, I think learning that empathy and looking someone in the eye and just letting them know like, hey, we all walk through a place of, of shame, of guilt, of embarrassment. We've all felt those things. And I, and I want to just hold space right now for you to be able to, um, if you need to cry, if you need to talk, I'm here. And I think, because I, I start thinking about the mental health crisis in our world and I get very overwhelmed. Um, and I'm like, oh, what do we need to be doing? And I think, and please speak to this, because my thing is, I want people to walk away today with gained knowledge, but also steps. What are some things that we can do as ordinary citizens of the world in our communities? And all of our communities are dealing with different things. I'm in Hampton Roads, Virginia. Um, so very different issues um, sometimes than Asheville, North Carolina. But what are some things that we can do as members of our community what are some tools that we can learn that can allow us to start addressing these things? Because yes, it's really cool when like a celebrity's like, me too. I totally get what you guys are going through. I struggle as well. I'm not just this beautiful, shiny thing. Um, but I would love for you just to speak to us. How can we um, even use some of the tools that you have um, and help people around us and in our community and our neighborhoods? Emily, you said the word that I would say is the most important, which is empathy. Mm -hmm. It's connection. It's taking really the sacred time to be with someone and explore their perspective and their experience with them in a non judgmental, compassionate way. That is what holding space is. Mm -hmm. When we're holding space for someone, judgment is on the other side of the door. <laughs> Our values and desires and agenda for that person are on the other side of the door. 
we are in that space with them with unconditional positive regard and acceptance, supporting who they are and striving to meet them there. Mm, That's good. I love what you just said, exploring their experience. Mm -hmm. Wow. Not trying to fix somebody, not trying to relieve their pain, (coughs) excuse me, but exploring their experience. That's fascinating. It is. And that's, I mean, we're so much, it's real natural for us as people who have big hearts and are trying to help others in the world to want to jump in and fix and problem solve and tell and get people to do things that we know or think would be good for them. Um, And we can get there with people, but first we have to meet them. Mm -hmm. First, we have to understand who they are and their values and their experience. And that means deep listening. It means listening not to respond or correct or fix. It means presence. Um, And that is um, something that we're not very practiced at in our culture. Um, And it's so important. And interestingly, so I train helping professionals really essentially how to be good listeners and how to demonstrate empathy and how, how to evoke and elicit from people their values and motivations for change rather than telling them what they need to do. And, you know, people come into the trainings often from that perspective of like, well, I'm educated and I have this resources for people and they need to do these things. You know, there's a strong desire to fix and help in that way. Um, But as soon as we practice this deep listening with one another, people say, oh, yeah, that's right. I know this is where it has to start. We can get to that other stuff, but it starts with that holding space. One thing that I'm interested in is I think most listeners would understand the value of exercise, diet, and sleep. But I don't think most of our folks would value mindfulness. Can you tell me why mindfulness is so important in that meds formula that you just gave us a few minutes ago? I always like to elicit before I respond. So my my okay, natural sure. tendency is like, what makes mindfulness so important for you? Meditation, prayer, and Emily. Yeah, I'll I'll start since Nick's Nick's thinking. So for me, I am a multi passionate person. I have many <laughs> projects. Um, like even before you heard, like I I'm a director of marketing at a large nonprofit. I am a musician. Um, I have a robust social life. I'm very close to my family, my fiance, my friends. Like I am going in a million different directions and I like that. That's how I like to live my life. However, if I don't stop and pause, I will be in a a not so great place. We'll go, we'll go to a dark place. I will get overstimulated. I will get overwhelmed and I will begin to withdraw. And anyone in my life who's close to me, they know if I start if I start being a recluse, whoa, huge red flag because this girl loves to be out and about and she loves people. So for me with mindfulness is I have to give myself that space every day where I pause, I reflect on the day, I reflect on my interactions. How did I speak to my colleagues? How did I address issues? Um, Where was my tone? Where was my attitude? Um, It's just kind of like a realignment time for me. And some days I need half an hour alone to do that. Sometimes I need five minutes to do that. Um, But for me, if if that mindfulness is not where it needs to be, it will bleed out into everyone in my life. Everyone will feel it and everybody will have to pay the consequence of me not taking that time. And I don't want that. Mm -hmm. So for me, sometimes it is more meditative. Sometimes it's a little quick journal moment. Um, Sometimes it may even be a mindfulness mindfulness moment with someone that I really care about who can give me uh, feedback in a loving way, but maybe with a little hard truth in there. Um, So yeah, for me, if there's not mindfulness, you don't want to be around me. And I'm, I'm self-aware to know that it's not cute. And it's not fun. (laughs) So um, for me, I think it is the grounding part of who I am. I love how you shared lots lots of different examples there of like sometimes mindfulness you gain through a conversation with a friend. 
Sometimes it's meditation. Sometimes it's journaling. Sometimes it's time alone. There are so many different ways that we can be mindful or awareness might be another uh, reflection, self-reflection. Um, we all have a compass inside of us. If we take the time to check in with that compass and we all have different ways that we do that the best. I'd love mm -hmm. to hear yours, Nick. Well, I, I just, a year ago, I, I picked up a gentleman that was dealing with homelessness in Asheville, North Carolina. And after I helped him get some gas for his moped and was dealing with some stuff, he says, can I have $20? And I said, what are you going to use the $20 for? <clears throat> and he went through and told me a couple of things he'd do with the $20. And I said, but what about tomorrow? He said, well, tomorrow? Well, you don't even think about tomorrow. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll deal with tomorrow tomorrow. All I need, $20 is, is the goal for today. If I get that $20, today is going to be a great day. And then tomorrow we wake up and we'll deal with tomorrow. And when I think about mindfulness, I think about simplicity. I think, uh, you know, even when you do meditation and you concentrate on your breath, we breathe all day long, but we don't even notice it. When we come out of, oh my gosh, what, what, what's my health going to be like in my 70s? Am I going to have enough money to retire? And, and we, we have all these things going on in our world. When I think about mindfulness, it is simplifying to right now, this moment where I am, and, and then trying to calm myself down, figure out what I need in this moment. So, and, and that may not be the way you look at mindfulness. For me, it's just simplifying and breaking off all the other pieces for right now. And meditation, journaling, prayer, those three things are things that help me calm down, lower my anxiety, concentrate on where I am, and put one foot in front of the other. Right. It helps you gain perspective mm -hmm. and be present. And you gave a great, that's a great example with the individual you named that was um, unhoused, that was living just for today, is yeah. um, that's also survival. And if we're not living just for today, then we have the privilege to be mindful, right? Mm -hmm. That allows us, I think this is where I kind of think about the survival brain is, um, you know, if we think about the brain like a ladder upstairs, middle and downstairs brain, our downstairs brain is that survival level. Our upstairs brain is our ability to reflect and think about and plan and have perspective. Um, if we're in survival, we can't access that and there's no time. And I think a lot of folks that, that live with less privilege would say, I don't have time for mindfulness. <laughs> or I have time on Sunday when I stop working for a couple hours and I go to church and that's when I get mine, right? So we each have different ways that, that we access that. Um, but again, I think of it kind of like that compass inside. Like how do, I, how do I touch base with my internal compass and catch a breath and be present and get perspective? And maybe tap in with the divine, you know, whatever supports you yeah. the most. So, Hillary, one of the things that happened over the last two years is I would put together pastor breakfasts and bring 10 or 12 pastors together across denominational lines and would just talk to them about what's the condition of the church? What are you dealing with today that's different than pre-2020? The number one thing they said is our congregants are coming to us for pastoral care but their issues are way beyond pastoral care. They're mental health issues, and we don't know what to do. We don't know how to help them. We don't know where to refer them. And so let me ask this question. What, what are some of the triggers that cause people to get professional help? When, when, what are some of the common triggers that someone says, wow, I'm a little out of control, and I just need some outside help to get through this season of my life? Gosh, what a complex question, kind of what, what brings people to their knees in order to get mm. additional support. Um, yeah. And, you know, I think about from the perspective of, of pastors, um, you know, the question is scope, like what feels within my scope and my manageability, you know, when a congregant is um, calling every day and showing up and has a high needs consistently, you know, something that the, the minister, the pastor and the community can't meet to support. Um, that's a clear indication that some external um, clinical perspective, you know, professional support could be beneficial from um, on the side of an individual who's come, you know, brought to their knees and saying, I, I need something to be different. 
that that um, gauge is going to be different for each person, kind of depending on their tolerance and threshold for suffering mm -hmm. and struggle um, and their community reflecting that to them. You know, some people are in a community where there is um, messages like don't you don't do that. Um, you don't get help. This the only yeah. way to get help is through church or the Lord or or work or your family. You don't talk about that outside your family. You know, there's those messages that prevent people from getting more support. Um, yeah. So I guess I just laid out a, a couple of different things. What do you think? Yeah, I would. I think the challenge in the church world is is that we represent God and God can do all things, and so it's like. Hey, I'll just pray with you and this will solve all of the problems or whatever. So I think a lot of ministers have a hard time of referring and saying, look, this is way beyond what, what I'm doing as a pastor. I would think if most people are dealing with a friend, family member that has chronic hopelessness, uh, struggling with addiction, um, those kind of behaviors is when we can, oh, maybe they even mention suicide um, yes. That we step in and we say, "Hey, you, you're you're stepping on some lines that, that that we probably need to get some help." And and I was just curious if there were certain triggers. Obviously, there's life situations like divorce and everything else that could trigger that. But I'm thinking about the people in my world that deal with chronic hopelessness or they are are dealing with addiction. Um, do you see that a lot? Absolutely. I mean, you named just the flags that I think we all need to pay attention to. Um, uh, what people say and how they say it, um, their affect, you know, what they what they they look like. Are they smiling? Are they engaged? Um, are they regular and then they don't show up for a while? <laughs> wow. What about that? Um, you know, if we're good listeners and good detectives, we pick up clues from from people, whether that's the individual or the individuals around them. Um, it's always good to check on folks. How are you doing? It's it's okay. And again, I have that normalized word. It's okay if you're not doing well. I, I'm really still interested in how you're doing. But certainly um I love the that phrase chronic hopelessness, um, suicidality, um when we see people lose jobs or struggle with money or um other big life events, death, divorce. Um, what are the other flags that come up for folks that well, signify maybe you, you need more? Mm -hmm. The consistency piece. When someone mm -hmm. suddenly acts out of behavior, um, it, right. it's just, it's not what they normally do. It, we got to be paying right. attention and say, wait a minute, that's not how you normally behave. How can I step in? And I always look at counseling as a, a splint. It's an external thing for a season to help you get through whatever you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. Obviously, Emily and I are like lifelong junkies about, hey, we want all the therapy we can get because we recognize the value of that. But I appreciate what you just said that when someone starts to act out of character, where it was very consistent before and now it's not, that's another clue. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that input. It is. And that's related to substance use too. You know, if someone kind of is a drinker or a heavy drinker, and then we can, <laughs> we see that change. That's like, Ooh, something's worse or different or yeah. Mm -hmm. If something changes about them, that's a good thing for us to track. And it's hard. I know people um, are, are tracking and trying to tend to a big flock in a lot of cases um, to pay attention to all the cues of everyone um, and that I think also is also where we can use community and um, have have others within the church that are helping us as leaders to keep an eye out mm -hmm. for those deviations. And I feel like that is another important factor why we need to prioritize self nurturing because if I haven't, if I'm not in a mindfulness space for me to even notice when somebody else is hurting, then we can't fix that right? We can't address those things. Um, so for people even listening now, I, I would greatly encourage, I know Hillary, you would as well, and Nick, that, you know, it, it, it goes back to the oxygen mask. Like I want to be aware and in a place where I can notice when my, my colleagues are in a place that I'm like, Hey, 
let me just check in with you. Do we need to talk? You know, let me encourage you. And I, I'm always the first one, like Nick said, we, we love in inner healing. We love therapy. Um, so I'm always the one to wave the banner and be like, this has helped me so much. Like, how can I get you to a place? And even one of my very best friends, um, has, she's never been to therapy. And even two weeks ago, she's like, you have talked about this so much that I, I scheduled a therapy appointment. Okay. And I was like, well, <laughs> Hey, look, I've never, I've always just shared my, my, uh, journey and my experience. And, um, but she's actually really excited, but she was like, I finally gave in. Um, but again, it, it, for me, I just think it's another incentive for us to stay in a, in a healthy place. Um, and for us to, you know, is that therapy, is it counseling, is it, um, a trusted mentor, counselor, whoever, um, but that way I can be open to realizing people's patterns and when they need help, um, and being able to be there for others. Uh, cause I can, I've definitely missed some big red flags because I was so entrenched in my own stuff. Um, mm -hmm. and I know we all have seasons, so I give grace to that, but, um, I, I want to, if, be as mindful and stay on, to on top of it as I can. Yeah, pay attention. Mm -hmm. And what does it take for me to take care of me so that I can pay attention mm -hmm. to others? Yeah. Wow, that's interesting. Not just mindfulness for ourselves, but mindfulness for the folks around us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> be able to love and help in those moments. That's good. So Hillary, I have a question for you. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Um, you've been you've been asking us such fabulous questions. Um, what are what are some things that you personally do? And I know again, this is not one size fits all kind of thing, but I'm just curious, as somebody who does this full time, and I you you have a family, you have your own community as well. But what are some things that you personally do um, to stay in that mindful place, to stay in that health healthy and healing place? Well, you know, before we got on this call this morning, um, I sat and I meditated for maybe 10 minutes. And then I wrote my journal for a little bit, had my cup of tea, and then I put some music on. Um, those are some ways this morning that I found some grounding and mindfulness. Um, I plan on taking a hike later today. I have the luxury today of having some space from my kiddos to do, get to do some self-care. So that's self-care, self-nurturing. Um, so that's what I'm doing. Um, I was reflecting recently, as I said, my dad passed recently and, um, he modeled this for me. Um, in the summers, he took a week off and would go camping by himself in the North Georgia mountains. And it was, uh, you know, I thought, gosh, maybe that's not everyone's thing to go camping alone for a week. But what that message gave me, what the message was to me is, it is important to take time to fill your cup mm -hmm. in whatever way that is. In fact, so important that I'll step away from my family to, to do it um, so that I can show up strong and in my best self for my family. Um, so, you know, for me, it's also time with girlfriends. Um, and what else is it? Making sure I schedule off periodically. Um, work can be very consuming and there's always people that need things. Always. Mm -hmm. Always. Um, and, you know, because I work for myself now, I run my own business, um, I make sure that I take time off quarterly, um, even if it's just a long weekend, uh, to check in and recharge. I have a therapist. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> uh -huh. I'm trying to think what is my other, my, what else is on my list? <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's fabulous. And I think, again, um, sometimes we need examples and mm -hmm. um, we need to hear, all right, well, I've never thought about journaling before, but let me check it out. And it might be, you know, somebody's new thing. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm somebody who always wants to, to know the practical and, right. you know, at the least steps. let me, let me try it out. And it may not be my, uh, my self nur nurturing, uh, activity, but, um, I want to try it or I'm open to trying it because mm -hmm. there are so many things and so many, I, uh, I mean, I, you get on the internet and it's like a million things coming at you. And so when I can hear from one person, Hey, this is just my routine or something I do to kind of get back 
in focus and on in an alignment. So I appreciate those practical things that you you've shared, and um, it's helpful because again, it may be something that's out of our our comfort zone or out of our box of practice, but when we can hear those things, it's like, okay, well, I can grab a pen and paper and see what happens. Mm -hmm. Um, or I can sit and do some breathing exercises for five minutes. So yeah, thank you for those practical tools. Yeah. And those tools can change across our lifetime. Yeah. You know, there was, um, for a long time, I did the practice of morning pages, which is from the artist's Mm -hmm. way. It's where you write for three pages, stream of consciousness, get all the crap out. And when I, when I do that, I eventually get all the crap out and then I eventually I hear my inner voice mm. and my inner wisdom. And I'm like, oh yeah, there I am. There you are. Um, and I have journals and journals and journals filled <laughs> with that. And at this time in my life, I'm not doing morning pages and I don't need to shame myself for that. Right. Um, it's something else that is working for me. It's some, it's some meditation and it's, I'm so busy. It's, it's not going to be 20 minutes twice a day. <laughs> it yeah. might be 10 minutes every other day. Um, but our lives shift and change and what worked for us then might not work for us Mm -hmm. now. And it might come back around, but I think that taking judgment of ourselves out of it, um, judgment of compare, like we don't need to compare ourselves to others. And if they're doing this and I'm not, then I'm not, I'm messing up. And we also don't need to compare ourselves to past selves. (laughs) What works for me now? That's good. That's a great word. Um, I used to do morning pages. I'm not doing them right now, but they were so beneficial and I really appreciate that. You just said something that I've never seen before. When you talked about your practices, you talked, you drank some tea and you turned on some music and you did some journaling and you meditate. All of those are solitary exercises. But then you went and said, and hanging out with my girls, having a girls weekend, doing something like that. My sister, um, just finished, just walked through a divorce and she just joined a softball team and the softball team enjoyed each other so much. They stayed together. Now they've moved on to kickball season. And I love that she's found community that mindfulness can be in community as well. And a group activity, not just a, an individual solitary activity. That was very interesting to me. Absolutely. I mean, I, it sounds like Emily, you're, you're pretty extroverted and I am as well. Yes. And I'm a verbal processor and sometimes I need to figure out what I mean and need through conversation. Mm-hmm. And so that is also mindfulness. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's good. That is really good. I love it. So quick question as we, so we were thinking about um, ourselves and our families, our friends. Is there anything in particular that you would speak to um, our workspaces or our jobs, um, because obviously, you know, sometimes that's a you're not going to talk to a colleague necessarily, like you would your best friend. But what are some things as colleagues we can be more mindful of, and um, how can we we take care of each other in a work environment? Hmm, that's beautiful. I think I come back to that word empathy, um, empathy, connection, listening. Um, you know, whether it's at the water cooler or lunch or catching a walk, um, how can we pay attention to each other and attune to each other in the work environment and little nibbles <laughs> and little pieces? Um, because there's such tremendous resource in our work community. If it's a work community that has health in it, um, we do hard work and we can't be alone in that work. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What do you all come across as you, you, I mean, you all have work communities. I know at least Emily, you do. And mm-hmm. cause you work for a nonprofit right yeah. now. I'm like by myself and I have some admin, virtual admin. So I have less of that. So I guess I would look to you as more with more for more info on that. Yeah. I mean, for me, I know there's a lot of people who are like, look, I come in, I do the work and I go home and I don't build connection and I'm the polar opposite of that. Um, I'm like, no, I want to know you because I want to know how, what, you know, what do you enjoy? What makes you tick? Um, do you like, even for the people that I, um, I'm their direct report, like, do you want me to be more hands-on? Do you need more feedback from me? Or do you want me to still let you run wild? You do your job and that's it. But I, I'm somebody who deeply believes if I'm going to be 
working with you for seven and a half hours every day. We don't have to be besties. We don't have to know every detail of each other's life, but I need to know you. And I feel like you need to know me enough that we can recognize these things. You can be very honest with me and vice versa. Um, Hey, I got some stuff going on at home. Again, I don't need the details, but I got some things going on. Can I have a little space? Or even granting flexibility, um, I think is very important. And I'm glad our culture is shifting um, post-pandemic to being like, hey, maybe it is better if they're not in the office all week this week. They've got, uh, they just need a little bit more space. They need maybe the comfort of home. So yeah, for me, um, again, we don't have to be um, a work family, uh, but we need to have a relationship with each other enough that we know each other to say, hey, I've noticed some patterns or, hey, I see you're pulling back. Are you cool? Is everything good? Is there anything I can do um, to help this environment and our work be as successful um, and enjoyable as possible? So um, yeah, that's one of the big things for me. Attunement. Mm-hmm. Attunement. Mm. I don't have anything. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the the birthday monkey came to mind, like when I worked in the homeless program at the VA, um, somebody brought in this like big stuffed animal monkey. And when it was each other's birthdays, um, somebody would organize it to come in early that morning and decorate that person's office with the monkey and whatever kind of themes were specific to that person. Like I at the time, I remember when they did the birthday monkey for me, they put, they put, um, what was it? Like, um, paper clips, they unfolded them and put them in the monkey's back. Cause I was really into going to acupuncture at the time. Oh. That <laughs> is like, so funny. It was, it was just little things like, or maybe it's somebody's a uh, UNC fan and that somebody brought in their UNC t-shirt and put it on the monkey, you know, something that said, I see who you are. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I care about you, and I'm willing to take a tiny bit extra space um, yeah. to honor that. Yeah, that's awesome. Beautiful. I love that. I love it. Well, Hillary, we have had an incredible time. I feel like this interview flew by. I feel like we just got started. Um, but we really thank you just for your insight and um, your graciousness. Like you're just a very I like just talking to you right now. I'm like I feel like I'm filled with more grace. <laughs> than I was an hour ago. Um, and I really just appreciate that. And just the reflection that that's who you are is bouncing back and it's really warm and beautiful. And so, um, we appreciate your time and insight. Um, I know I've enjoyed this conversation. Um, and I know Nick has as well. So we just, we appreciate your time. Um, as we wrap up, is there anything else you would like to say? Anything else? Um, if not, I would love for you to, um, let us know if people were like, ooh, she said something and I, I got one more little question for her or I'd like to connect with her. Um, is there any social media, even professional, like a LinkedIn or um, more broad of a Facebook, Instagram or website or how can people connect with you? Absolutely. Well, one thing I think listeners can't see is like the warm glow that is on each of our faces as we're kind of ending this conversation. There's like... I can feel the connection that's grown and that connection has grown because each of us are showing up with genuineness and compassion and open hearts and deep listening. And like, those are some of the ingredients to the good stuff. Right. And, and um, I think your listeners can probably feel that too. Um, There's lots of ways to connect with me. Um, The organization that I am the founder and CEO of is called MI center for change, like my center for change, but MI. Uh, So my center for change.com. And I'm on Instagram at Hillary Bolter and I'm on LinkedIn. You can connect with me there, Hillary Bolter. Um, what else? Yeah, I've got Facebook. I'm on Facebook too. I'm on all the platforms. She's on it all. Awesome. Well, we will, we will link <laughs> all of those. Oh, look at you. She's on YouTube. I have a YouTube channel. I do a little, uh, awesome. but basically I, I'm trying to spread what we're talking about, which is yeah. this compassion, empathy, connection, non-judgmental. Like this, this is where it begins in the work that we're doing as people. And I, I put out a YouTube video every week about it and all sorts of stuff. That is awesome. Well, we will link all of that um, down below in the description. So please go check that out. Hillary, again, thank you, Nick. Am I missing anything before I do our, our wrap up? 
You got it, girl. I feel like I just had therapy. Let's go. I know. I know. I'm feeling great. Um, awesome. Well, again, everybody, thank you so much for joining this conversation. Um, please feel free to reach out through our email. Let's process that at gmail.com or comment in uh, the little comment section down there. Um, you can connect with Nick and I. Again, we always provide our links to all of our ways of connection online. Um, so please do that. Again, thank you, Hillary, so, so much. We appreciate it. We also appreciate um, our amazing producer, Adrian Vosch, this incredible music that you're listening to by Caleb Honorkamp, and all of our photography done by Allison Frost from Before the Foundations Photography. You guys have an incredible week, and we will see you next time. Bye-bye.